Okay, welcome everyone to the third session of this training school, which will uh, be led by myself and Philip Biermann. Um, I am a research fellow at the TU Dortmund University in Germany. And Philip, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, I'm a research fellow at the University of Magdeburg in Germany. Um, I'm an economist mostly working on well-being and also sometimes on energy poverty with this project I started working in energy poverty. Right, yeah, and I'm, um, I'm a transport researcher uh, at the Department of Transport Planning and uh, yeah, my research unsurprisingly focuses on transport. Um, so this session will focus on transport energy will, uh, poverty double energy vulnerability and impacts on well-being uh, and uh, wealth impacts. Uh, so we'll have two presentations by myself and Philip on these two main aspects uh, to start the day. Uh, so without further ado, if there is no question on your side, I will um, now share my, start my presentation. Um, Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So I'll start then. Um, so what about transport energy poverty? Transport energy poverty is a term that is starting to be used in this community. But um, to date, most of energy poverty research has focused on domestic energy consumption, oh, but transport accounts for a lot of energy consumption, a lot of like, impact on the environment and a lot of um, ex household expenditure as well. So there is a recurring question whether we should actually be thinking uh, whether there is a transport equivalent to what's traditionally being considered as energy poverty and whether there, uh, we should think about energy poverty as something with two main components like domestic energy poverty and transport energy poverty. So this debate is not resolved at all. Uh, there are a few complicating factors, including the fact there are uh, a few conceptual and practical differences between the two kinds of energy consumption. Uh, transport energy consumption is different in many ways, and that sort of complicates the, the analogy between the two. And there's also a long-standing tradition of research on transport poverty, which runs completely parallel to this, that is not primarily concerned with energy. Uh, so the question is how to deal with that. But in this presentation, I will completely ignore all of these conceptual questions uh, and complications and just give you an overview of indicators that have been put forward in this context. Uh, so this is a table where I've tried to summarize publications that have um, proposed indicators of transport energy poverty, and they can... Um, in my view, be uh, organized in three groups. Adaptation of domestic energy poverty indicators. So studies that have tried, for example, to take the 10% indicator, the twice median indicator, and apply it with due uh, adaptations to the transport sector. Composite indicators, which we've seen yesterday, what, what it is, um, which have tried to uh, pick up the different dimensions of transport energy poverty. And then there is something called Forska ownership indicators, uh, which we'll see later what that means. And all of these indicators have been applied to, um, I mean, can be applied to different units of analysis, either to households or individuals, mostly households, or to sub-national spatial units to see differences uh, across the territory of one state, or to states to rank them uh, with each other. Uh, as you see, most of the effort has gone into adaptation of domestic energy poverty indicators at the household level. And most of these studies have used survey data, although there are some quite a few studies that have used model data as well and census data. So what I will do in this presentation is just to go quickly through a few illustrative examples for each of the cells in this table. Starting, and, and by doing this, I will uh, a few times refer to my own work. Apologies for that, but there is just not that much work in this space for me to be able to avoid that. And also I'm more familiar with my own work than the work of others, of course. Um, so there have been many adaptations of uh, domestic energy poverty indicators uh, for households. And this is an example of something we did where we tried to adapt the HILSIS uh, low income high cost indicator for use in the transport sector. 
And you can see that in this graph on the X axis, we have income, net of housing costs and net of running motor vehicle costs equalized. So we considered motoring costs only, not public transport costs. We considered running costs only, not the costs of purchasing new cars for various reasons. And we set an income threshold at 60%, just like the Hilsis indicator. On the Y axis, we have the share of income spent on uh, running motor vehicles. And we set the thresholds at twice the median. So actually our indicator is a sort of hybrid between a twice the median indicator and a low income high cost indicator for various reasons. We thought that was the best approach. And in the top left corner, you can see low income, high cost households, which account for 9% of households in the UK. That's what we found using family expenditure data. Um, a second example of adaptation of uh, domestic energy poverty indicators is the French uh, official uh, indicator of, of uh, transport energy poverty or uh, energy precarity in the transport sector, as they call it. It's, as far as I know, the only country in the EU which has an official indicator. They've estimated that it's, it's basically a twice median indicator for mandatory car trips, so car trips only as well. Again, if I remember correctly, and it was based on the census. It was based on some heavy modeling so they didn't have any actual data on how much people uh, ex uh, spent on travel or even on how much people traveled, actually. They just knew where people lived and where essential services were. And uh, based on it, they made, made some heavy assumptions and, and modeled that. Uh, so I have some my reservation about whether this is sensible and you can really estimate all of that based on assumptions. Uh, but as you see, the results are plausible in that rural areas tend to be uh, more affected by transport energy poverty. So coming to the second type of indicators is uh, composite indicators. Uh, this is a, a very good, uh, an example for a very good working paper by Berry in France, and she um, um, used some unique data that they have in France where they carried out a national representative uh, survey on, on energy consumption. Um, and they had lots of questions on energy, so they were able to uh, propose uh, in uh, multi-dimensional composite indicators of uh, energy poverty in both areas, in both sectors that take into account not just the monetary aspects of it, but also the non-monetary aspects of it. Uh, and in the case of transport, that means not just looking at income and expenditure, but also the energy efficiency of the vehicle, whether there are good alternatives to car use, and whether there is some uh, restriction behavior in terms of people not traveling to places where they would need to, or whether they report difficulty in meeting uh, fuel costs, so subjective indicators. Uh, and I, uh, I think that's a great approach, and it's a shame it wasn't published as a as a proper paper. Um, but that was one of the readings that I recommend, and it's it's in the program. So if you if you want to know more about it, um, then there's a second kind of composite indicators, which has used this approach to look at subspatial, uh, subnational, spatial unit. So here there is a parallel tradition of research in transport studies and in urban planning, which is research on uh, research on oil vulnerability, which is basically to see which areas would be most affected by an increase in, in fuel prices, whether driven by changes in the oil price uh, globally or whether driven by, by carbon taxes and so on. And most recent work in this area has used this tripartite conceptualization of vulnerability, which is actually quite common in terms of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So exposure would be mostly how much people spend on motor fuel, how much they travel by car. Sensitivity would be low income, and adaptive capacity would be the accessibility to, uh, uh, to services by alternative mode. So how much can you still travel to places without using the car? So in practice, areas are defined as very vulnerable would be areas where people use cars a lot. They have low, despite low income and, and, and also have very few alternatives to doing that. Uh, so that's exactly the approach that we try to use in, in uh, our, my work with some colleagues in the UK where they have some unique data about uh, car use and accessibility, which few other countries have. And we combine them to make this map of um, uh, vulnerability to fuel price increases 
And as you see, there's predictably uh, very high levels of vulnerability in rural areas, but also a big difference between uh, London and the Southeast and Northern city regions where there is more vulnerability despite being urban. Um, so now coming to the third, uh, that I will go very quickly on this because it's part of the hands-on exercise later on. Uh, OpenX, which is an ONG at the EU level, has uh, proposed uh, composite indicators to rank um, EU countries uh, in, uh, with respect to both domestic and transport energy poverty. And here they propose uh, one uh, in considering three elements, energy expenditure, affordability of public transport, and access to public transport. And we'll talk about based mostly on EU silk data. And uh, we'll talk about this later on. Uh, so the third kind of uh, indicators is forced ownership indicators. That's a concept that some of you may not have heard, but it's uh, established in transport research. And it's basically the idea that some households own cars despite being poor or very poor. And that sort of me is interpreted as meaning that they are forced into it, that they have no alternatives. And also it can be interpreted as an indication of the fact that they uh, are trading off expenditure on car and uh, car fuel and car energy against other essential items of expenditure. And I, 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 I used an indicator like that uh, to compare the UK, Germany and France finding roughly that the, um, the highest levels of forced car ownership are in France, the, the country of the yellow vests, uh, and then in the UK and then Germany, the lowest. Uh, um, and also interestingly, in both the UK and Germany, levels are higher outside of dense urban areas, but not in the UK where it's the other way around, which is interesting. So um, this is based on the EU silk, and this is an approach which is interesting when it comes to comparing different countries. Um, so uh, I'm not aware of work that has used the uh, force car ownership approach to uh, other uh, units of analysis than the households. But in principle, there is no reason why you can't do that and just single out, for, for example, regions that have high levels of, levels of car ownership and low levels of income. And that's what I've tried to do here just for my own curiosity with uh, not two uh, units uh, in, the, in, in Europe. And what I've found is that for car ownership is highest in the southern Italy and in Poland. Um, so in the last um, minutes of uh, this presentation, I will uh, tell you a little bit about um, double energy vulnerability, which is basically just um, which is a concept which has been used for a long time in the French debate, where they have more of a tradition of thinking of both sectors. And it's basically just the overlap between domestic energy poverty and transport energy poverty. And it's been used since uh, 2007 in the French debate and only more recently in, in the international debate. Um, so there have been a few studies in, in, in France that have um, estimated like energy poverty in both sectors and then uh, try to see how many households fall into the overlap between the two. And they typically found that the overlap is very small. Uh, so people who are in uh, domestic energy poverty tend not to be in transport energy poverty and vice versa, which means that uh, three to seven percent, depending on those studies uh, of the population. So any, anyway, in the single digit, a uh, single digit uh, share of the population will be in the overlap. Uh, what I think is interesting that the flip side of this is that a pretty large share of the population will fall into either because the two don't overlap. So if you consider energy poverty as a, as a more global phenomenon, which includes both domestic and transport, then you end up with a share which is 20, 30%, depending on, on these indicators, at least in, in France. Um, so that's uh, what we tried in, to do uh, in um, this work uh, by uh, Caitlin Robinson and myself, where we try to overlap my own indicator of vulnerability in the UK with the existing indicators of uh, fuel poverty in the UK and uh, in England. And we found that uh, it's mostly rural areas that are affected by both. And uh, it's just between two and 6% of uh, spatial units. So not a very high percentage. So to conclude in the last minute, I hope I was able to show that there's actually quite a few different approaches to investigate in these areas. Uh, uh, quite a few uh, experiments to build on. 
although they are fragmented across countries, there are linguistic barriers. A lot of that is published in French only. Uh, and it's also fragmented across fields of research. For example, there's, uh, there are these concepts like force ownership and all vulnerability, which uh, have not been put forward with energy concerns in my uh, primarily. Uh, but I, I think they can be used, uh, but uh, they, are not, uh, they are not born out of research on energy poverty. Um, and much of it was great literature, not published as journal articles. Much of the publications were put in, in the table. Um, and there is to date leader work that has tried to bridge these uh, national disciplinary divides. Uh, but who knows, perhaps some of you will contribute to bridge those in the future. And with that, I am done with my presentation and I will stop sharing and uh, leave it to Philip. Thank you very much. So um, now we are going to start or, or to go over to something more conceptual. Um, now we want to come to the welfare assessment of energy poverty or transport energy poverty. Um, I will talk about the general need for welfare assessment, uh, some different ways I will just describe very shortly, and then I will come to the welfare assessment with the help of subjective well being data. And as an example, I will cho I chose one of my own works, uh, which is published as a working paper in a working paper series uh, in my former university um, concerning energy poverty and subjective well being in Germany. And um, we, I will yeah, put the discussion a little bit towards the direction of how this can be adapted to assessing the welfare effects of transport energy poverty, uh, which is something that Julio and I already planned for some years now, but um, it, is, it is still a plan in our draw, but um, hopefully in the future we will, we will have uh, the time and the effort left to, to uh, go to that area a little bit further. Um, first of all, I want to talk about why do we need an adequate welfare assessment in terms of energy poverty and but also in general terms, then uh, how can we use the subjective well being approach um, to to do that kind of welfare assessment and how can the welfare effects of transport energy poverty or energy poverty or uh, even poverty be quantified using the subjective well being approach. So first of all, there is this natural nexus between energy poverty or transport energy poverty and individual welfare. What do I mean by natural nexus is that everyone knows that poverty or uh, energy poverty is something that harms people's well-being or welfare. But the question I asked in that paper is, uh, can we empirically observe or prove that this nexus exists? Yeah, so it's a little bit more conceptual than the previous one you've seen. Um, and the question is, do we find or the, the, the empirical question is then, do we find a negative correlation between individual welfare and energy poverty? And then a more interesting question for the future maybe is what channels or circumstances drive these effects? So if you can prove the effect, you can also um, step a little bit further and look what are the relevant channels for, for um, these welfare effects. Let's have a look on the subjective well-being approach in general. Um, the theory behind it is utilitarism, where you have utility as a function of different um, aspects of life, circumstances, decisions, um, whatever, which is determined here by the different variables x, y, and so on. So, but the important thing is that there is no um, x ante functional form or whatever behind this, this uh, relationship here. And to measure utility or to quantify utility, there are different concepts. The first one is the one most of you might know is the revealed utility approach, where we, where we observe what have people decided for. So we look at purchase data and whatever, and say what people decided for is what they want, and what they want is what increases their utility. The second uh, type of utility measurement, I would say, is the stated utility approach which goes into the direction where we ask the question, what would people decide for? So we give them situations, hypothetical situations, and ask them, what situation would you decide for? And the, the, um, the aspects of the different uh, situations are then 
um, derived as utility driving. And the third one is the one that uh, is used in the subjective well-being approach is the experienced utility approach, where we say, how did people decisions affect their level of welfare? And this is kind of an indirect approach where we say, well, we try to quantify or observe people's utility, look what they have done or uh, how they decided or in what circumstances they are and um, try to um, try to observe or model the empirical relationship between people's decisions or circumstances and their level of welfare. And in that framework, reported life satisfaction or reported happiness is a surrogate for people's subjective well-being, where you can say, okay, we have the reported well-being, which determines the underlying conceptual happiness uh, function or well life satisfaction or well-being function. In, in, in empirical terms, you construct uh, empirical equations or regression equations where you have subjective well-being, you need to measure it somehow. I will come to in a minute to that. And then you um, you correlate it or you, you measure the effect of different aspects of life, different circumstances or decision variables, observed variables on this subjective well-being. And uh, what is important in this framework is the so-called Ceteris Paribus assumptions, which we also have in our economic models, but which uh, is especially prominent in the empirical models. Uh, for example, if you if you do ordinary least square regressions or whatever, and then you always have Ceteris Paribus, uh, which means that the effect of a variable is independent from the effects of all other variables. So this beta one coefficient here, if this is a, a certain circumstance or a decision variable, um, the effect of this variable, which is beta one on subjective well-being is independent from all the others. And this will be important for one of the parts which I will talk about if we distinguish between income poverty and energy poverty in a minute. So what about the subjective well-being approach and energy poverty? We can say that life satisfaction is observed to correlate with social demographic economic uh, attributes and circumstances. This is already a long standing literature which has analyzed those effects. And you can see uh, you are also have some kind of stylized uh, effects like family life, uh, employment type and so on affecting subjective well-being. The question we ask then is, do people in transport energy poverty or energy poverty experience significantly lower levels of welfare? And the second question, which is important, is then what drives these effects? The paper I want to present today is one of my own, which is called How Few Poverty Affects Subjective Well-Being Panel Evidence from Germany. I sometimes switch between the terms fuel poverty and energy poverty. Um, Stefan Budorowski and colleagues, as you all may know, uh, have, have written a paper on, um, on this uh, distinction between the, uh, between the between energy poverty and fuel poverty and that we should overcome it and just call it energy poverty. So just feel uh, like I'm talking about energy poverty all the time or transport energy poverty. So the equation or the model behind this work is that we say life satisfaction, which we, which we measure by um, answers to certain questions in, in, in polls or uh, questionnaires, is determined by fuel poverty or energy poverty, a large set of control variables, which are found to be stylized facts of this life satisfaction to um, ensure that with people being in energy poverty, we don't measure just something else, which is by coincident at the same time uh, happening to people in energy poverty, for example, um, uh, ha not having a job or uh, having many children, living in small homes and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, um, we want to control for net income, so income level and relative income with income poverty. And this is kind of the kind of the key result of this study to distinguish between income, income poverty and fuel poverty, uh, because as the Citrus Paribus assumption, we can say if if you if income or the reduction of income, disposable income for other goods is the only thing determining the effect of fuel poverty on life satisfaction then this coefficient here would get insignificant once we control for the income level or the relative income position of the people. 
here we plug in our standard or we plugged in different standard um, energy poverty indicators. Uh, here I've written down the two times median indicator where you have uh, the poverty line with energy expenditure relative to income being larger than two times the median of this share in the relevant reference population. Um, and the question we asked then, or the data we used for that is the German socioeconomic panel. We use data from 1993 to 2013. The panel goes a little bit longer uh, backwards and uh, it started in 80, 1984. Uh, but from 1993, you have the, the health data, which is a very important control variable. And so we decided to go from 1993. A second aspect why you start uh, uh, after 1991, 1992 is uh, that you have the re German reunification taking place in 1990. And therefore, many studies using this German socioeconomic panel um, start in uh, start from 1992 or 1993. We have around 40,000 individuals in the data set, with uh, means in the end uh, more than 300,000 observations. And uh, the data set co uh, contains a lot of this uh, social demographic and economic information, and also expenditure data, for example, on heating and electricity. And another thing which is important is that we have a panel structure. I will not be very specific about that here, but this is an important aspect why we chose this data set. Um, the question on life satisfaction or the quantification of the uh, utility or welfare level here is how satisfied are you at present with your life, all things considered, and then you, uh, people respond on a scale from zero to 10. So now the question is how does energy poverty correlate with this level of measured utility? And does this effect hold when we control for absolute and relative income aspects? Well, due to the, this uh, ceteris paribus mechanism, we can say if we plug in absolute and relative income and still the uh, energy poverty coefficient here remains significant, that that would mean that we have proven in that kind of data set and framework that energy poverty has a measurable and sizable effect um, beyond the, the mere income deprivation effect. And here I have the results for you. So um, we, you can see here that in, on, in the left uh, three columns, we have tested um, the, the absolute income and three different, um, three different energy poverty measures. So this here is uh, what I call type one or absolute po energy poverty measures. The second one is the relative energy poverty measures uh, where you relate the energy expenditure to income. And the third one is the uh, low income high cost indicator here, um, which, which was in the, uh, from Hills uh, in 2012. And on the left hand side, you can see the effect of this uh, variables in the model where all the other social demographic um, variables are included as well, um, that it remains negative, significant and sizable. In, in effect size. Um, sizable means in, in this subjective well-being effect is sometimes a little bit difficult to interpret the size of the coefficients. And so, so you compare these to other important aspects of life. So if you can see here, it is being in energy poverty by, this in, by the two times median expenditure share indicator means that uh, uh, it has the same or it has one fourth of the welfare effect of uh, having having a worse health status, self-rated health status, or one fourth of the effect it has to become unemployed. So it's it's a very sizable effect, actually, also compared to other um, other uh, effects you find in literature literature on subjective well-being and other factors. And then if we if we plug in the relative income sphere here, income poverty, you can see that those effects in size at least in this expenditure share and the low income high cost indicators decrease um, by magnitude, but they stay relevant and significant. Yeah? It, the decrease in the low income high cost indicator is a little bit larger, which is naturally because um, the income poverty uh, indicator is part of the definition of this indicator. Okay, so what did we find here? Here's our um, mean expenditure share. Um, what do we find here? That there is a sizable negative effect which goes beyond the mere income deprivation effect. So it is not only the kind of economic argumentation 
that um, because it reduces your income, um, energy poverty is a bad thing, but also there are measurable and sizable effects which show up in these kinds of um, in these kind of data set, uh, which go beyond the mere income sphere. Yeah, and since we only have the yeah, kind of, as you know, there are multi-dimensional indicators on energy poverty and so on and so forth. But you can see even with this very expenditure and income-based indicators, you can see that there is a is an effect which goes beyond, um, which goes beyond the mere income deprivation effect. Uh, another thing we have uh, done in the study, I'm not sure about the time I have left. I have to look look at the clock. Yeah, well, I'm quite on time. Uh, so um, another thing we have found in the study is that not only incidence of poverty, but also intensity um, um, matters, which is kind of an which was kind of a natural or an expected result. All the results were expected, let's say, from a um, energy poverty science point of view. But the interesting thing is that you can actually prove that in those kinds of data set. And um, what we found then is also that the intensity. So not only the question whether you fall below the poverty line or not, but also the distance, the relative distance to the poverty line. Um, matters here in this in this setup. So what can we say about um, the question is income uh, energy poverty distinct from income poverty? We can say yes, it is it has a negative sizable effect on life satisfaction and the effect is robust beyond uh, the income deprivation channel. How can we now measure the effect of transport poverty on individual welfare? Well, um, the use of subjective well-being data or this uh, poll or questionnaire data is that on the one hand, you have an empirical model where you can quantify these correlations and where you could also try to find other channels. And the second thing is that um, one example from Churchill and Smith from Australia is that you can find interesting um, additional aspects of transport poverty on subjective well-being. Like they, for example, analyzed that um, the negative impact on high, of high transportation costs on the opportunity for social interactions with family and friends, which is uh, kind of something that goes also beyond this uh, near income income argumentation. Okay, thanks for your attention. We are happy to receive your questions and comments now. Yes, we now have 15 minutes for um, plenary discussion. So please. Don't be shy. Remember, we are being recorded, so any extended period of silence will be. <laughs> oh, yeah, please go ahead. I've seen a hands raised, yeah. Good morning. Thank you, Philip and Julio, for your presentations and insights on this topic. I have a provoking question. <laughs> so on a stage, uh, and we have seen yesterday and the day before, on a, on, a, on a stage where we are still like struggling to understand better energy poverty at the household level. So countries are really still really behind on national strategies, on, on their understanding of energy poverty. So do you think that bringing to the public agenda and policy agenda an additional topic, bringing more um, nuances to the already complex and really um, with lack of knowledge and indicators. And so bringing uh, transport poverty to this discussion is it's insightful. I think it is, and, you, and I kind of know your answer, but uh, how do you see, see this framed within the general discussion for policy and the design of the national energy and climate plans, the long-term strategies. So to include this discussion as well on a, on a problem that is still really um, yeah, under research in some location. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that's a very good question. Uh, I think we will get to some of, of those uh, difficulties later on in, in the wrap-up where uh, we have um, a plan to talk about um, uh, policy challenges to uh, bring this forward. But I'm, I'm a bit into mind about this because I definitely see the challenges and how um, 
you know, there's a there's a risk of spreading the the, the energy poverty agenda too thin, and might not be strategically for many of us what we want to do uh, in each of uh, our um, national debates. Uh, and the topic is very very much not there in many countries. So, for example, when we had the uh, there was a call for applications for the different hubs, and we didn't get any application for this hub on transport energy poverty from Germany or or anywhere else um, from Germany, I think. So definitely in Germany, it's not a topic and it's not on the agenda. On the other hand, when I see things like uh, the yellow vests, uh, I think well, there are actually there seem to be some very high sensitivities around questions of how much people spend uh, on on transport energy and how much should it be taxed and so on. Uh, and we do not see the same kind of mass movement, for example, for when energy, um, domestic energy prices are raised. Uh, so it seems that in, in, in the real world, that is an issue that, 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 uh, that exists and, and then creates some sensitivities. Uh, but I'll stop talking. Uh, and um, I think we have Luca and then Harriet with their hand raised. So please. Hello. Um... Thank you for the presentation. And I sorry that I did join in late, uh, late, so I didn't see the first one. So it might be possible that you already asked the question in your presentation. Uh, but referring to what you were saying, that there is uh, not so much awareness of transport energy poverty, I'm asking an opinion as a researcher of transportation, like yourself. If uh, uh, using the same term, as for poverty, energy poverty is well embedded in housing or related issues, using transport energy poverty is actually create confusion in the in the situation. Also for your work, I believe that you, I think you passed from transport inaffordability to transport energy poverty. So yeah, are there any issues? Are there any talk about this? How uh, solve the overcome this problem that can be? Or if it is a problem. Yeah, yeah, it is a problem. It is very confusing. And uh, there, there was a, I mean, it is confusing even if you don't like bring the energy into it. Uh, even if you just take the tradition of research within transport studies on these issues, it's gone from being around transport and social exclusion 10 years ago, 20 years ago, to being then later on about transport poverty. And, and, and the same authors use the same terms pretty much interchangeably or not. Uh, and so that is already confusing. Uh, and then uh, there have been efforts to bring that into dialogue with energy poverty, but then do you call it transport poverty in that concept or, or transport energy poverty? And uh, yeah, I've been guilty myself to add into the confusion by using different terms. Uh, it's just that I think when I started out my career, I had this naive idea that I would, you know, bring a clear um, term into the debate and make everyone stick to it. And then uh, over time, I just, um, you know, resigned to the fact that I will just rather use different terms to pitch it to different audiences uh, if that makes my life easier. Uh, and I think uh, each of us struggles with that, with that thing. As I see, like British colleagues are talking about fuel poverty within the UK, but then talking about energy poverty on the European stage, just because you know, these debates do not really use the same terms. So I think as long as we're clear about what we mean, it, it will be fine. Uh, so it was Harriet. Uh, thank you both for, for a really interesting set of presentations. Um, I guess with kind of a policy hat on, I was thinking that you know, often the departments that are responsible for addressing these two different dimensions, um, domestic energy and transport respectively, tend to be quite separate. Um, and we know that cross-departmental um, working tends to fail, um, at least kind of within most European governments. So how can we, um, as kind of practitioners and researchers, contribute to um, trying to bridge these gaps um, and you know, contribute to, to greater cross-cutting policies that enable buy-in from quite distinct sets of policy actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I mean, I'm not sure I have a, a positive answer about it. I just can, uh, you know, echo your your sentiment that these things are difficult. Um, uh, was uh, six years ago we organized an intersector workshop in the UK where we brought together like people from uh, the 
what at the time was the Department of Energy and Climate Change and the Department of Transport uh, to sit uh, there with us and discuss about these topics. And they were like, oh, wow, this has never happened before, actually. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can do it, but there are definitely, you know, institutional barriers to that. And I've recently examined a PhD student who's gone to the respective policymakers to ask uh, um, say to energy poverty, to fuel poverty policymakers in the UK and ask, oh, but what about transport and vice versa? And the responses were mostly like, oh, yeah, well, what about it? We have no idea. We're not, you know, when. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, there are a bit some efforts to bring these things together, but it's all very early days. Um, so we'll see. Um, uh, maybe Philip, maybe yeah. I can say a word to that because um, I think that this um, welfare assessment, not only with subjective well-being data, but also with other uh, with other terms or other approaches, is very helpful uh, to convince policymakers. Because if you if you can kind of give them uh, a proof that this is this is welfare relevant or relevant for everyday life of people, and this um, life satisfaction approach is something which is which is uh, hard use or, or where it is hard to convince people in science, uh, it's harder to convince people in science than policymakers with this kind of approach because of the question, uh, how happy are you or how satisfied you are with your life, um, they, they have a very clear understanding of that and uh, very often it helps to convince policymakers. On the other hand, you have a kind of in this in this quantitative setup, you have kind of an average effect on, on life satisfaction, well-being, welfare, whatever you want to call it. Um, which is then also a good motivation for policymakers to have kind of the average effect on people. So the kind of uh, the effect on, on people in the middle of the population, which is kind of a perfect argument for a policymaker. If, if, if most of the people or the average of the people are affected by something, that this is an important issue. And uh, uh, it would, would be helpful to, uh, to then um, in a second step present uh, solutions for the problems, right? So uh, now, uh, Rodrigo. Yes, thank you both for the information. Um, I got a little bit curious about the double um, energy availability um, uh, uh, representation for the for the for the assessment. So, what would that represent for us if the 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 percentage was higher? than expected or how how the how does it impact on the the overall um topic um yeah i think that uh, that there's very little research on how people uh, negotiate and trade off expenditure between the two but uh, you can definitely imagine that in a situation where they uh, houses are under pressure, uh, having to spend more than they can realistically afford both on, say, uh, electricity and heating and car travel. There might be all sorts of compounding effects, such as, uh, say, people having to um, spend on, on, on commuting. Some, this is something for which there, is, there are some hints in the literature that people cannot really cut, if they are car dependent, they cannot really cut on fuel expenditure for commuting because if they cut on that, they would lose their job and they would find themselves in a much uh, worse situation than, than they start from. So that is not negotiable. Whereas like domestic energy is to some extent more negotiable and you can, you know, you can be cold and you will not, you lose your job. You, you may might uh, compromise your health uh, on the longer term. But um, so I think uh, it would be interesting to look a bit more at those um, interactions between the two. I hope that answers the questions. Uh, and then Miguel. Hello, good morning. Thank you. I think you also just answered my question that it was that I have noticed that uh, a lot of people don't mind spending, uh, let's say, 200 euros on uh, gasoline and uh, tolls. But if they get uh, an energy bill at their home that's like uh, 100 euros, it's uh, completely different. They get shocked and it's too much. And uh, there's that perception that uh, car is not negotiable, while the um, thermal comfort and health, it's negotiable. And uh, it's very, very strange, but it is what it is. And uh, a second question that uh, would be, uh, how do you see uh, concrete measures that could be adopted to mitigate transport poverty, let's say at uh, urban scale or uh, 
urban and suburban scale. Uh, yeah, so two things uh, about the, uh, the, the negotiation of the different trading off between the different types of expenditure. Um, what I said about commuting is plausible, but there's also an element of um, expenditure on transport is, is a means to an end, depending on the purpose for which you travel. And some of those purposes are necessary, such as commuting, but some others are more like luxury and uh, such as traveling for, for, for leisure or for holidays. And, and um, I think if you look into it, then a lower income households tend to cut on these first, you know, like leisure travel and so on before domestic energy and, and, and then perhaps commuting as last. So it's difficult to generalize all across transport expenditure because just because it goes into so many different things. Um, and in terms of policies, I think as, as, a, as a broad message, anything that, that reduces car dependence uh, would help with that because uh, what really brings people to spend lots is uh, situations where they have to use cars despite the fact that they are so expensive or despite the fact that they are, um, uh, you know, they cannot really afford it. And conscious of the time, uh, now we have, I think we have Pedro and Harriet. I'm not sure if your hand is still raised or... Uh, uh, yes. Raised again. Okay. No worries. So Pedro, and then we'll we'll close the uh, the, the question and answer session. Yeah, my, my question kind of overlaps with uh, Miguel's question, also about policy. Uh, I was wondering what could be a good example um, in terms of policy for for social support in, in these cases of of uh, of car forced ownership. Would it would it be a good example, perhaps a social uh, tariff or or social supports in terms of uh, um, maybe payment for, for those people who have to use the car in, in rural areas. And how, how does this, um, how do we manage this in terms of also the uh, situation of a trade-off because we have uh, environmental targets and, and in, in a way you're supporting people using cars, but also you, you need to, to support these people because that's the only chance they have. And also this more in terms of the short-term policies because we know that investing in transport infrastructure is very expensive. And, Normally, it's a long term. So, how could you? Yeah, what would be a good example of support? Uh, yeah, that's absolutely spot on. You're pointing the finger on a very serious trade off there. Uh, and I'm not sure I have an answer about the good examples, but what I can say is that there have been examples of programs to support people with car ownership and use, uh, support them financially. Uh, in the UK, in France, and in the US. And there's a very nice paper by some French authors about it from to, dating from 2007. And they uh, precisely, they find that these programs exist, but they soon run into lots of trouble uh, because they are very expensive. Because by supporting car ownership and use among lower income houses, you take uh, you know, uh, ridership away from public transport which you're, you're also publicly funding. And so like public transport becomes less profitable uh, and you need to put more, put more subsidies into that. Uh, and also it, it, there, there, are, there are huge trade-offs with the environmental aspect. Uh, and so these programs really never went beyond like the local level because just because generalizing them to beyond that is, is so tricky. And, and uh, But there is definitely a tension there when, when the situation is very car dependent, then yeah, the, 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 the most immediate way to help people in those situations would be to help them with using the car more. Uh, uh, but uh, that's also probably what you do not want to do because of other policy priorities. So all these tensions, I, my, my impression is all these tensions are more pronounced than, in, than for domestic energy, where there is more scope for win-win solutions, such as you, know, you insulate the, 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 the building, for example, and that will help you on both sides. Uh, and that's uh, trickier to, to uh, achieve that in, in transport. Uh, so we're a bit mm, we're a bit beyond, but I don't see why. I mean, we're supposed to have an informal chit chat later on, so I don't see why not taking any questions. What What do you think, Chris? Um, we'll, we'll I cut. think we can go for for one more question and and shorten yeah. the chit chat. Right? Is Is it okay for you all? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So last question, Adam. Javier. Hi, yeah. Um, just leading on from what you were saying, I was wondering if you care to comment a little bit about uh, alternative methods such as car sharing schemes, 
Um, here in Switzerland, there's a, a very interesting building development as well, where residents aren't permitted car ownership. Um, so it's uh, the idea of using a, a, a car or somehow subsidizing cars in terms of uh, reducing transport poverty wouldn't ever cross their minds because, um, as I say, car ownership isn't even permitted. But there are rather successful car sharing schemes, um, particularly because cars tend to be quite inefficiently used. Uh, so, yeah, I'd just be interested in your comments towards <coughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, there is definitely potential in these solutions, um, at least in theory. In practice, though, uh, I think the 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 the, uh, the scope of of, of car or the penetration of car sharing is typically overestimated. If you look into it, it's typically just in in the largest and densest urban areas in in the city centers and and um, very a very small share of the population. I'm talking about less than five percent, say in the UK, as ever used a car club uh so there is that um and these services are typically not uh, not present in the most car dependent areas because they would not be profitable it would, would be logistically challenging and also the few studies that we have about who uses th those services uh they tend to be like actually people in in the middle classes who have you know have no no financial problems and they just find it more convenient when living in the city centers to rely on on car sharing uh, and these services are not present in areas of more deprived areas and so on. So they seem to, um, to some extent, uh, their distribution and their take up uptake seems to uh, uh, um, make certain patterns of inequality worse rather than, than helping with that. Uh, so there is a bit of a tension between what these services they could achieve if they were uh, implemented with say, uh, uh, inequalities in mind and what they actually achieve uh, uh, at present, I suppose. Thank you. And with that, uh, should probably um, so I just muted myself. We should probably uh, close the, the this yes, plenary please. discussion and uh, did you and press pause and then have an informal chit chat. I mean, we can keep talking about this or whatever else in the eight minutes that we've left. Uh, okay, before. thank you very much. I will press pause now. Can you see it? Okay. So, yeah, are we recording yet? Uh, so we now have 15 minutes to introduce the hands-on exercise with the prepared material. Um, we probably don't need uh, all of 15 minutes and we can um, hopefully leave a little more time for the hands-on exercise itself. Um, so uh, what we asked the trainees from, from, from our group to uh, do in preparation was to have a, a quick look at this indicator which i briefly introduced in the previous presentation which is um, an indicator proposed by openx uh, where they propose an energy transport poverty index for european countries based on three indicators uh, one is uh, energy expenditure so the share of transport energy expenditure out of total expenditure for the first income quintile so just for the most uh, deprived sector of the population and then affordability of public transport. So the share of the population with income below 60% uh, who report that they cannot afford or they struggle to afford regular use of public transport. So that is a subjective uh, item. And then access to public transport, it, again, it is subjectively access, uh, assessed and just for the uh, most uh, poor. And here on the left, we have how um, uh, different countries rank uh, on these dimensions. Um, and as far as I know, they, and I was like marginally involved in reviewing this report, uh, the choice of indicators was very much based on data availability. So they basically took any indicator that exists, uh, that is comparable across EU 28, uh, that could say something about um, transport energy poverty. And there just weren't that many and, and then that good um so uh having this in mind uh we have uh we will uh 
assign you to uh, breakout groups uh, who will discuss uh, the following questions. Uh, the first one being uh, which aspects of transport energy poverty are adequately captured by the um, e, e by this indicator and group two which aspects of transport energy poverty are not uh, adequately captured uh, so think about like if, if anything that's been left out and uh, then uh, Philip do, do you want to talk about the the, the um, yeah, so um, group three has to answer the question, how can the subjective well-being approach help to construct an adequate multidimensional EPI? Um, this goes into the direction on how can we, uh, on how can we find, for example, channels through which um, transport energy poverty uh, influences subjective well-being and how can, the, can this approach help to find the right um, um, aspects, to find the right channels and um, to, to find um, aspects that should go into the EPI. And the second one is, or the fourth one for group four is what are the main requirements in terms of data quality to capture the multidimensional aspects of ET EPI. Um, one problem of course is uh, we need to have the data available and we need to have um, data on a large scale and so on. And you you should think about um, what, are, what are the most important requirements on, on data um, based on the indicators you can see there. Right. Um, so are there any questions before we assign you to uh, the breakout rooms? I will uh, now stop sharing and share. Uh, I will uh, put the, the slides with the different questions in the in the chat so that you can download it and see uh, what the question for your group is. Um, and then I will also paste the questions into the chat just to be on the safe side. And while I do that, please come forward with any question you may have. So the questions are there, uh, the slides are there as well. So I think we're ready as soon as you are ready with uh, the breakout groups, Philip. And then we should probably set the time to 25 minutes rather than 15, because uh, that's maybe good to have some more time for discussion. Okay, so then, we will sign you to the breakout rooms and see you in 25 minutes. Did you did you press pause? Wait a second. <laughs> I have to find the button. We'll start recording. Okay, welcome back. So now we are uh, curious to see what you can report from your groups. I would suppose that we start with group one and then uh, so on and so forth. So please, group one, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so uh, for the group one, we had the question, which aspects of transport energy poverty are adequately captured by the ETEPI indicator? So uh, we extracted some information from the document, uh, uh, starting with the note that only a few causes of energy poverty were actually captured due to, to data shortcoming. But considering that, it is uh, being considered the share of transport energy expenditures, which covers fuel costs uh, on the vehicle efficiency, distance traveled, uh, also the difficulties, another aspect, the difficulties in assessing, accessing the transport network. Um, another one, the public uh, affordability or the costs involved in the, in the transportation and the distance uh, traveled. 
Um, so basically, uh, it is focused on people with in clear, clear cases of transport poverty. We also wrote down some good points re uh, related to the uh, the, S the, um, the ETIP metric or index uh, that they are simple, kind of simple to analyze and compare. And they also focus on the priority groups. So, so group that are uh, indeed in energy or transport poverty. I'll try if, if the guys want to add something. From my side, that would be it. Oh, anyone from group two? Yes. Um, so our question was to answer the question, which aspects of transport energy poverty are not adequately captured by the ETP indicator? I'm, I'm hoping I, I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, so we brought up two key points. Um, one is related to um, the air pollution exposure actually uh, coming from, uh, from those who use some sort of types of uh, export uh, transportation. And you know, like there should be some sort of measure to indicate how much you are exposed to, especially for those who are um, more vulnerable in different senses. Um, and of course, it also comes together with a uh, like degree of spatial inequality. Um, and the second point that we brought up was um, the time use for travel uh, with its different aspects as well. Like for example, um, um, I don't know, simply just commuting for um, essential uh, tasks and so on. And also, we were thinking about somewhat including um, the necessary alternatives to uh, get to one place. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you have more alternatives that can indicate like um, a better position, for example, um, if you have to switch from bus to train and tram and yet again something else. Um, then it can indicate that you're not necessarily in a good position. So basically these two or two and a half things were the key uh, messages that we discussed, uh, but we were also thinking about um, the list or the ranking of the countries that there are, I mean, questions actually, <laughs> that we would like to know why. Uh, uh, were indicated in, in this way. For example, the access to public transportation for Spain is like empty. I guess so no data was av available. I'm not sure. Um, also, Romania, the energy expenditure is zero yet again. So I'm curious, or we were, we were curious what happened with those um, uh, indicators or sub indicators. And um, yeah, the, the, uh, we were just bringing up some, some ideas that there were some interesting cases. For example, Finland usually performs well on uh, energy poverty indicators, but in this case, it's like the second to last. Um, yeah, these were our notes and my peers are welcome to comment if they want to. I think what we were talking about as well is that it's it's it really is a sliding scale rather than a binary of of yes no uh, do you suffer from this um and that there will of course be very very different uh, big differences between the rural and urban areas um and perhaps a better way to consider it would be under a a more broader term of uh transport justice rather than uh, transport poverty um, so a just system where we could look at it via the prism of perhaps you know the distribution uh, recognition of different people's needs uh, different procedures that there are for transportation for them uh, perhaps even 
uh, bring in then the global effect, which could tie in with this whole, uh, then making it very clear that electric vehicles aren't quite as um, as clean for everyone as as people might think. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, group three. Who was in group three? I can say something. Right. If, okay. yeah. um, our question focused on, on the, the EEPI index. So it, it considers both the transport and the domestic energy poverty. Um, and I, I would say uh, one of the main takeaways um, of our discussion would be to the, probably it would be interesting to to have um, a subjective well-being approach uh, to determine the different weights, like to ask people about their current situation and also about their optimal situation, and according to these results, determine different weights for for the the sub indexes for the domestic energy poverty and for the transport energy poverty. So for some some groups, transport energy poverty will, would have a higher bigger weights. And for other groups, perhaps domestic energy poverty will be more important. And with this information, we could compose um, the final index or the global index for for different um, for different uh, social demographic groups, for instance. And maybe I pass the word to my colleagues for other <laughs> for other final considerations. Yeah. I mean, something else we discuss is the um, scale at which both domestic energy poverty and transport energy poverty are measured and observed. Um, in the sense that uh, domestic energy poverty makes perhaps more sense to be um, measured at the um, household level, because everyone who lives under the same roof needs cooking, heating. I mean, they're sharing basically domestic energy services, not in a perfectly equal way, there are people who spend more time at home or and people who spend more time outside um, the home. Um, but then uh, for transport energy poverty, um, transport as an energy service is very different for different household members. So I mean, gender and age will play a very significant role in explaining those differences. And um, that, no, that's an issue how, because how do you reconcile method methodologically and technically like these um, two scales, if you're trying to put together a composite index. I mean, um, we think that the silk, the survey income and living conditions, they, it has items um, both at the household and at the individual person level. So we think there's some scope to, um, to harmonize these two scales there in a, in a sensible way. And um, yeah, that's, that's it. I don't know if Luca or Marta would, would like to add anything. Uh, I'm afraid that my audio scope, so people start talking and then I saw you talking, so I don't know what you actually said, so... I, I, I still... Sorry, that's, I cannot add anything, I'm sorry, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you said whole that we have discussed. That's great. So, shall we move on to group four? Oh, yeah. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, we were um, working on question four. It was um, uh, me, Lynn, and um, Iona. Uh, the question was main requirements in terms of data quality to capture the multi-dimensional multi-dimensional aspects of the uh, ETEPI. Um, we found two um, two reasons, and one of them was you need to look at the um, urban and rural um, differences because it will vary quite a lot between accessibility and also potential cost. Uh, and also when you're looking at the uh, indicators, they weren't from the same year. So one was from 2014, one was from 2018. So it makes it quite difficult to compare. So maybe you need to look at variables that are captured in the same year. Um, and that was the two reasons that we found. Right, thank you. Uh... 
I, th I think that they were all great insights. Uh, we have two minutes left. Maybe I'll respond to a couple of points I thought were very interesting. Uh, and that, then I'll leave it to Philip if you want to do the same. Uh, on transport justice, uh, the, 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 the term is used in the transport literature uh, more and more in the last few years. Uh, interestingly, it doesn't cover all of the aspects in terms of distribution, recognition, and, and uh, procedural. It is really used more in terms of just distributional, but it's making the point that while the transport poverty literature is a bit not, tends to be not non-normative, not to say how things should be, it just takes for granted that those patterns of poverty are, you know, self-evident self-evidently unjust uh, transport justice goes a bit beyond in terms of saying you, you need to set out how a transport justice system should be but it, it's still very much focused on the on the distributional aspect uh, there is another strand of literature lit uh, recently which is called mobility justice which makes the case that we should be more uh, you know inclusive in terms of considering the the procedural and recognition aspects and uh, things like the global impact of materials from evs as they were mentioned but they link to a tradition of studies, which is mobilities research. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that, but they make it even broader than that, that they consider not just transport, but all kinds of mobilities. So for them, even us zooming now would be a form of mobility, as in virtual mobilities. So uh, from my point of view, that ends up being a bit too comprehensive and too, too broad, and uh, a bit confusing sometimes. Um, uh, I think it was a very interesting point about Finland uh, which is like uh, very good in terms of energy poverty, energy efficiency, and so on, but it's very car dependent. That's what I hear from from people living there, uh, researchers living there. Uh, and uh, interestingly, the the opposite case is Hungary, which is, as far as I know, relatively bad in terms of energy poverty, but they have some of the highest levels of public transport use in the EU, so they tend to rank low on 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 transport energy poverty. I think. Uh, and yeah, great point about households versus individual. Uh, so transport is uh, energy consumption is definitely more individualized than, than uh, domestic energy consumption. So that makes it trickier. Uh, although if you focus more specifically on things like affordability or car ownership, those things, then, you know, inevitably they become like more household characteristics, like whether there is a car in the household uh, and and whether, uh, you know, uh, how, what level of income um, the household has and so on. So there's a bit of, um, yeah, it's a bit tricky how to negotiate the individual and the household aspect um, in that. Um, Philip, do, do you have any? Yeah, so I, I found very interesting on the one hand, the, the arguments about the scale um, with the help of Silk or maybe also those national uh, questionnaires, you can you can directly compare, um, or you could also model and try to find out how important the um, the scale is if you are on the household level, if you are on the individual level, and um, what are the, the the insights if you if you um, look on on uh, people's behavior or uh, maybe also on, on people's uh, attributes on the on the household and on the individual level uh, the other thing which i which i also had in mind um, already sometimes but uh, didn't didn't focus on so much is the weighting within the different indices and this of course is something which you can do with this um, well-being approach quite quite well on the uh, there are some examples from uh, if you think about those uh, computable generic liberal models to model a whole economy, uh, sometimes this subjective well-being approach is used to um, to quantify uh, demand elasticities and so on. And um, these demand elasticities, in some sense, are also an index of of um, preferences of people. And in a in a similar way, you could wait. You can try to. Um, to adapt those weights or calculate those weights from from the um, household surveys, and uh, the silk is a is a very good example of that. Um, we are in a step at the moment where we still need to um, motivate um, also the the uh, the the. Um, yeah, the, the 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 institutions which which um, do those surveys to implement enough questions for that, and to implement the right questions, and to ask for for the right um, to the right 
some attributes of the households. And um, to motivate that, you can use very detailed and panel study uh, like questionnaires like the BHPS, which is very good in that sense, the socioeconomic panel from Germany and the one from Australia, the HILDA. Those are the three um, major questionnaires with, who have, which have the um, best quality on individual and household level data, I would say. Um, and with those, with those data sets, you might, you might even try to figure out um, other aspects, like the Australian example where, um, where they uh, ask people, how often can you visit your family and friends, which is a very important aspect on, of energy poverty and especially of transport poverty, but which is not recognized so much in, in official indicators or whatever, and which is also not very present in um, questionnaires like SILK and international data sets. Um, but to, to prove that there is a relevant effect and a sizable effect, um, those national questionnaires and those national data sets are very helpful um, to get uh, to, to nudge institutions in the direction to, uh, to focus on the, on the relevant areas. And then um, maybe also to, to, um, to calculate the respective weighting of these uh, focus areas in the, in the respective indices. But the, on the other hand, and that is what we've seen in the report of Group 4, um, if you want to do that kind of um, quantitative assessment, it is you have very high requirements on the data quality. Yeah? Uh, this, is, this is always a, uh, a very important point, because if you want to, um, to prove effect directions and not just correlations, you need panel data and so on and so forth. So this is a very, uh, very tricky field which is on the on the conceptual side rather than on the empirical side but um, but which has uh, um, large consequences for the uh, feasibility of empirical studies you can conduct with the, those kind of data sets okay right so we now have a proper break not an informal chit chat one so don't feel like you have to <laughs> Okay, uh, I will I will stop the recording for the yeah. for the um, we'll press group, pause group discussion. And... Thank you very much, everyone. I'm back. Now it's in progress. Okay. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we now have fifty minutes um, for the presentation by Trini Trini Group was assigned to this hub uh, in response to the following challenge which was what are the additional challenges of measuring transport energy poverty and assessing its impact on welfare and well-being as compared to domestic energy poverty. Uh, these are the names in the trainee group. And uh, I understand that Daniel Vibben will present. And uh, so now I will stop sharing my screen and uh, over to you, Daniel, to share your screen. Great, thank you. Um, it says you cannot start sharing while the other participant is sharing. Oh, not sharing any longer. Uh, so I think you have to stop sharing for me to be able to I, share. Can you still see my screen? Because uh, I stopped sharing. Maybe it takes a, takes a minute to try again. Am I sharing now? It's yes. uploading. It starts and you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks so much. We, we, we've, um, we've lost a couple of members uh, at the last second, but uh, they helped us prepare all this presentation. So I'm gonna do my best uh, uh, to kind of explain some of the, their input from the, the three readings and Catherine's going to chime in uh, with some of the slides that she's built, some of the research that she's done. So we're going to just talk briefly again about this issue of um, transport energy poverty and the additional challenges of measuring it. Um, and a lot of this conversation extends and, and things that uh, Philip um, and Yilio kind of mentioned this morning 
um, and thinking about how transport energy poverty, not only how it's measured, but how it impacts uh, welfare and well being, and how do we measure these things? Um, so, first of all, there's this issue of who is affected, and Catherine, maybe you can mention a little bit more about, about these aspects. Sure. So, um... Yeah, so we wanted to first of all think about who was affected by, by transport poverty. Um, and th this uh, review by Lucas et al in 2016 showed that on a, on a broader scale between 10 and 90% of the population were potentially affected by transport poverty, depending on the definition used and the country uh, in, in concern. Um, and then there's an ongoing study um, which um, resulted in this paper by Simcock et al, where they look at the, the overlap between groups affected by fuel poverty in the UK and transport poverty. Um, and just to, to make the point there that in that figure, there are some sort of common offenders um, common to both groups. So including low income households, um, households with children, um, ethnic minorities, um, and people with health and, and mobility difficulties. Um, and the study also identifies that both transport and fuel poverty um, occur in both rural and area, urban areas. And so they can't be considered as a rural or urban issue separately, but uh, occur in both, in both instances. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I didn't realize when I put this together how much we were going to talk about the OpenX study today, but anyway, everyone's familiar with it now, which is great. <laughs> um, so on the left is the uh, Transport Energy Poverty Index, and on the right is the um, Energy Poverty Index and showing uh, member states progress in alleviating the different types of poverties. Um, and I just wanted to make the point here that there's um, quite a big difference in the state's um, vulnerabilities to these two different issues. Um, and Luxembourg in the index ranks as having made the best progress um, and Hungary the least. Um, and this was attributed to the relatively high costs of both public and private transport in Hungary. Um, and also, as, as was mentioned before, Ireland and Finland um, ranked pretty poorly um, in the index. And this was due to limited accessibility to transport, despite being relatively high income countries. Thank you. And so kind of building from some of this uh, previous literature and the presentations today and then the readings, we kind of identified four issues or, or things to look at, you know, in thinking about measuring transport um, energy poverty compared to domestic energy poverty. The first one was we called this issue of elasticity. Um, and this relates to uh, also to vulnerability, but also to exposure sensitivity and this adaptive um, capacity. Um, the second one was, you know, what is the distinction that we need to make and why are these distinctions important? Um, you know, one of the readings identifying that, that just two, there was just 2.6% overlap um, between energy poverty and housing and transport. Um, one of the third issues was this idea of inclusivity and then also coming back to vulnerability. So who are these hard to reach people that, that we might not be able to understand how they're experiencing transport poverty? And then the fourth issue was, you know, how do we define and measure subjective well-being, and especially when it comes to transport? And, and I think this is interesting uh, with this concept of experience utility. Um, and, you know, thinking about things like the commute times and the ownership and the benefits or the burdens or this forced car ownership and health risks. And of course, like relating all these issues of transport poverty and, and our subjective well-being in this age of a climate catastrophe. So um, I just want to review these again. The first one is this idea of elasticity and the transport alternatives. Um, I think as we're trying to measure this in, in not just thinking about the cost of public transport, but how do we create policies that either um, privilege private property or public infrastructure, you know, and, and how do those, uh, where's the tension between those? Um, of course, as the readings have showed, there's limited ability to adapt to the rising fuel co um, costs and other ownership fees. The, the burden is increasingly being placed on um, individual private car ownership. And, and that's good in, in the energy transition, but there's going to be people that are 
are going to suffer and people that are vulnerable to these increased costs. Um, and then finally, you know, all of these issues of, co um, of transport poverty and our new kind of transportation policies that have to relate back to COVID-19, you know, that, that those that some of us are not being forced to um, commute as often, um, others are, and usually they're putting themselves at risk using public transport, you know, so how, how are the kind of measures and indicators from the past year and a half going to impact how we view transportation and transport energy poverty in the coming years. Um, thinking about this, you know, the distinctions and how do we create these distinctions between um, transport energy poverty and domestic energy poverty. This was kind of the, the key point that we found, this 2.6% here that was both sectors. Um, and how some of these are limited to car related transport. I mean, we know that oil vulnerability is one of the, the kind of premier ways that we measure transport energy poverty, but is that itself a car centric, you know, way of measuring and understanding uh, energy poverty that leads to an overrepresentation of households using the car. Um, we, we thought this was an interesting graphic, you know, thinking about how um, transport energy poverty again leads back to this idea of subjective well being, you know, how transport energy poverty and the lack of uh, access uh, to public transportation or services or opportunities has this kind of snowball effect um, where people are spending more time and more resources in order to, to work or just to, to get to school or the other things that they need. Um, that these penalty measures, again, this kind of relates back to as we shift from this uh, model of uh, independent private car ownership to get rid of older polluting cars, there's going to be vulnerable populations that are not able to respond to that shift. Um, they are not gonna be able to afford either hybrid or electric cars. And then, you know, who are we targeting with these kind of zero emissions mandates that are so important to reducing climate change, but, but how are we going to kind of uh, make sure we don't leave those vulnerable populations behind? And then um, finally, we're thinking about this idea of subjective well-being. Uh, and again, as Philip mentioned, experience utility. Um, how can these EP metrics um, and subjective well-being be tied to the, our commute times and urban access or, or parking, you know, the time that we spend, um, you know, traveling from not just from A to B, but the quality of that, that kind of travel and public transport, how can we measure that? Um, and then thinking about car ownership, especially and what are some of the hidden costs and the, the benefits and the burdens, you know, how do we relate that? I mean, what does, what does owning your own car and the ability to drive and have a driver's license, you know, how does that, I think for some people that is a sense of freedom and a sense of pride and a sense of ownership. Um, and how do we measure that in, in the people that just absolutely want a car, um, for, for various reasons, not just for mobility reasons. And then when we dig deeper into thinking about car ownership and household car ownership, how is this revealing certain gender disparities? You know, research studies suggest that if there is a, a, a family with a car, um, that often usually the male figure in the, in the family is driving the car more often. And so how do we address that in thinking about energy, energy poverty? And these distinctions. And then, of course, uh, I mean, not so dark, but uh, climate change, you know, how do we think about transport energy poverty and these, these things that we're pushing into um, transport into our new policies and how are they relating to the kind of the psychological effects of what am I doing to the climate by driving my car or taking the bus versus a lower carbon mode of, of travel. And uh, we have, of course, some measurement challenges. Uh, yes, so I wanted to, um, with this slide, to think about um, in the broader scope of the training school and also um, 
to think about some of the measurement challenges um, shared between transport poverty and energy poverty, and so some of those that might be um, individual to transport uh, poverty. Um, and so key challenges were data availability, definitions, and also context specificity. Um, and shared challenges um, with regard to data um, availability include recentness of data. We've seen that's a problem um, both yesterday and today with the two different versions of um, poverty. Um, and also um, ability to conduct regional analysis is something common to both transport and energy poverty. Um, with regard to uh, transport poverty, however, the relative lack of um, research and, and political engagement with the issue um, means that there isn't this availability of the necessary um, da data, which is detailed and it's costly and time continuing to get hold of, which can act as a, a barrier to policy development. Um, regarding definitions, um, we know that with regard to energy poverty, um, there's a lot of discussion about definitions and um, and this also applies in the case of um, transport poverty. And as we, we touched on before, um, even members of the same house, household can experience either transport or energy poverty to different degrees. Um, and the multi-scalar and multi-dimensional aspects of, of each can, can make them challenging to define. Um, with regard to transport poverty, um, this non-energy aspect of transport poverty makes it perhaps even more uh, challenging to define um, than energy poverty. Um, and this this lack of research and political interest as well um, makes it makes it hard to, to define. Um, and then with regard to context specificity, um, in both cases, we don't um, either use transport services or consume energy. Um, usually just for the sake of it, we want to um, gain access to services or goods or activities. And these are usually quite socially and geographically specific. Um, but with transport poverty, um, this, there's, with energy poverty, there's a lot of discussion around capabilities, um, but with transport poverty, this is potentially even more complex because what is the right level, what is a fair level of access to transport when we take into consideration um, large distances to be travelled, available time, um, and what we would prefer or, or choose to use um, with regard to our transport mode. Um, and I think that's that's everything. So thank you um, for taking the time to to listen to our presentation, and also thank you to Anais and, and Luca who who couldn't be here today and helped us to put this together. Yeah, and, and to and Daniel too. To you, thank Catherine. you, Catherine. <laughs> no, and, and uh, we're we're kind of improvising here a little <laughs> bit um, in putting this together. Uh, this obviously is a, is in my field, uh, but I've been. Um, grateful to learn so much over the last few days and to be thinking about these issues uh, that are so interconnected. I guess I just wanted to add one more thing and maybe this is kind of moving into discussion, but you know, I, I think the way I approach this is kind of thinking about it from oil vulnerability um, to start off. And, and the more I kind of thought about it and looked into it, I think there's uh, kind of a policy vulnerability here you know, that we're shifting these policies in order to limit carbon emissions in so many different areas, um, but that there's going to be populations which are going to be vulnerable and who are going to be impacted by the policies that we, that we make, that we change in order to help reduce carbon emissions. And so um, I thought that was just something that was kind of um, came up for me uh, in, in this. So thanks. Uh, thank you, guys. I thought you pulled it off incredibly well, uh, knowing that like you you were let down by the other two at the last minute. So I I think that was great. Um, um, I just wanted to comment on one thing, which was uh, correct myself. I previously said that uh, Hungary was doing well with transport energy poverty according to the OpenX, but it turns out I was wrong. Like uh, it, it turns um, it's scoring relatively uh badly uh on account of high uh, transport um costs for public transport so that was incorrect on my part uh but is there any comment or question from the rest of the group yes miguel yeah, I can ask just a quick question. It's uh, how do you two see the um, 
the dispute for public space uh, in cities regarding transport, the different modes, and uh, also the dispute on public uh, funding finance. So a city spends uh, 50,000 euros on a, a new cycling path or a new bus in the outskirts mm -hmm. versus the city builds a giant parking lot uh, in the center of the city. Well, I mean, I think anecdotally, everyone hates parking um, now <laughs> in multiple ways. I, I mean, I, I think that that hopefully we're past the age where we're going to build new parking lots. I think kind of what we're maybe focused on here is the, you know, what are the different affordances and constraints of building that cycle path, you know, because building bike paths seems to be uh, really important. Um, but bike paths are not going to serve everyone, you know, and so it's, it, it is a low carbon solution. I think it's an important solution. I think the, the cities, at least that I've seen, uh, the research from cities that are kind of eliminating parking or eliminating sh cars within their city centers are seeing many benefits, um, from them, from those policy actions. Um, but not everyone's going to be served. Their transportation needs are not going to be served um, by those alone. I think maybe what's interesting, maybe it's not exactly um, what you asked, but like maybe what's interesting as well is the balance between like increase in the uptake of cycling and the decrease in um, car usage, because like one issue that strikes me with cycling is, is safety, right? And like, how, how do we like some people would only be willing to start using bikes once they know they're less worried about interactions with cars. And so I guess that balance is going to be tricky in the future. I guess it's just a, a reflection I have. Sid had a question. Please sure. Um, thanks for a really uh, um, engaging presentation. Um, lots of thought provoking stuff there. I, um, I wanted to pick up on the idea of uh, measurement and these different transport solutions. I, I like that you flagged that um, there can be multiple reasons people are barred from using uh, modes, whether it's cars or bicycles. And one mode that's been quite uh, captivating for me is these uh, e-scooters. Um, they, of course, uh, are not short on controversy in terms of use of public space, um, but, you know, it's, it's come up over and over that they can um, solve some last mile problems, some micromobility issues. And, and then I wanted to ask a question related to that about the limits of the focus on transport energy poverty. Um, when I think of e-scooters, I, I think of um, how does this um, impact sort of uh, socio-spatial um, targets, right? How, for instance, does it only solve things in city centers or in areas with enough urban density, or can it also mm. serve last mile issues in, um, in suburbs? And, uh, and, and then which actors are actually pushing this? What is the role of regulators? So this question of regulatory lag in a sense with uh, where you could see these, this as an innovation in micromobility, trying to help towards a decarbonized system. Now, can, so <laughs> sorry, very long winded background there, but um, I hope it helps um, uh, address this question. How, how does a conceptualization of transport energy poverty help us? Does it actually risk kind of forgetting that sort of problem or does it help to have policy impact? Um, I, I can speak from, from my perspective. I, I think it probably helps to have policy impact because it, it brings these issues to, to people's attention. And maybe like if I <laughs> jump on the example of the e-scooters, like, um, I think that with, with e-scooters, like I do think they they have a role and like they, particularly with COVID actually, I, I think that people were more keen to use them because it was a, it was instead of using the Metro, they could use a scooter and they weren't inside with other people. So it was a, a viable alternative in that way. But maybe one issue there is um, about, um, I think Harriet brought up in the previous um, presentations about who um, who owns them and that they tend to be privately owned um, and also mm -hmm. like they tend to be like app based 
Um, and so like who uses apps, it tends to be like a certain like younger demographic or people who are more technologically engaged. And so maybe if we start thinking about, um, if we use transport poverty as a framing for that, we start to think about who's excluded and maybe in that way we, we can consider how to include those people in, in policy. So that's, that's what I'd say on that. I don't know if Daniel wants to comment. No, I mean, I, I think you brought up all the, the right issues there, you know, especially with e-scooters, like it's a, it's an allocation of space, but um, there's an allocation, you know, a thought about mobility issues, right? And that each time that we're making this push to create, again, more, um, less carbon intensive transport policies, there's going to be people that are unable to uh, kind of adapt to those as easily. There's a question from, from Adam. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, taking this little bit about the e-scooters a bit further, we've uh, uh, had obviously issues with them in Basel as well, but uh, research seemed to indicate that rather than it being connected to um, people using the car less, that it is that last mile where people are actually not using public mm -hmm. transport, which may already have been decarbonized. So in terms of sustainability, <laughs> the idea of replacing a tram journey, which is uh, completely carbon neutral anyway, in, in the case of Basel, with uh, an e-scooter, with the whole issue of the production of the batteries and so on, um, is perhaps slightly more problematic. Uh, that, that's just an add-on. What I wanted to, to ask about more was about nudges in terms of the use of bike paths. And um, I was in Torres Vedras in, in Portugal. We were given a, a tour of the sustainability aspects of the town uh, and they have a counter on the bike path which is is quite prominent in order for people to see how many people have used this bike path each day um, obviously they, they keep this data because it's useful for them but the reason why it's so prominent is because of this issue that i think it was uh, catherine was raising earlier on in terms of uh, um trying to make people more aware that it is safe and secure, that there is this option of, of, of riding a bike without the, the feeling of risk. Uh, and they combine that in, in this town with um, free, free bike repair workshops around the town uh, to really try and stimulate it. But I was wondering if you could talk a, a bit mm -hmm. on that aspect, on sort of the behavioral aspect, trying to nudge people towards more sustainable transport. I think that actually relates back to this, the, these issues of identity and subjective well-being. I mean, anecdotally, I think people that ride their bike and that, that ride often and commute often, they love it and they like to talk about it and they tell other people how much they like to, to ride their bike and, and the paths that they're on. Uh, and so I think a counter like that kind of capitalizes on that. The culture, like bike culture, I think is becoming increasingly important. Um, and, and I, and I think in a way it's, it's either counteracting or replacing car culture, right? You, I, I think very few people in, in 2021, like talk about how much they love just driving their car to work or not. I mean, there are still obviously a big section of the population that, that really enjoys their, their cars, but those usually aren't the folks that we're trying to reach with these kind of policies. Um, so I think things like that are really important, especially for measuring subjective well-being. You know, how do we talk about these nudges and kind of the critical mass? I mean, at least in the U.S., this idea of critical mass is often related to people in with bikes and, and these kind of bike parades that happen in, in different urban centers. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a really helpful take on it. Thank you, um, and I just like. Personally, I, I want to say thank you, Adam, because I, I live in Portugal where I had no idea um, about that <laughs> initiative. So <laughs> it's interesting for me to, to find out about it. So, so thank you. I don't really have anything else to, to add apart from that. <laughs> uh, I wanted to add a comment on the question of, of uh, spatial, I mean, road space allocation. 
because uh, I think that's very important. But curiously, the little literature that we have on transport justice doesn't get into that at all. It's more about the benefits of how, say, ac access and accessibility are distributed for many reasons. Uh, but there's been a few interesting studies recently, one in particular by Felix Koitzi, which I would recommend to anyone who's interested about how road space is allocated in Berlin. And they came up with this idea of, okay, let's uh, brainstorm all the different justice perspective we can start from to allocate road space, right? So proportionally to model share, or let's take a utilitarian perspective, let's take a libertarian perspective, let's take roles and so on. And the interesting finding is that one that it's it's not, you know, there's not just one way of allocating that road space. It's pretty, I mean, normatively, it's pretty hard to think about, but also that no matter what which justice approach you adopt, you would never give so much space to parked cars. So there is actually no justice way to justify that. We, we just do it, but there is no way to uh, that that is fair in any in any meaningful sense of the word. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. And there's also another piece of research by colleagues in the in the states where they uh, went around the cities and looked at uh, how many cars are illegally parked, I mean inappropriately parked, how many bikes and how many e-scooters. And they find uh, that actually cars are the worst offenders. You know, but we don't we don't have that many that much controversy around you know illegally parked cars because it's almost a bit taken for granted that some of them will uh, be illegally parked. Uh, uh, but as soon as there's a few e-scooters illegally parked, that suddenly just because it's a change on the status quo uh, that suddenly creates uproar. So I think uh, when it comes to cars, there's a lot of these. A lot of things are taken for granted, and and it really asks of you of you know just trying to question, start questioning the things that appear as self-evident or just natural um, um, to question that status quo. But I think that's a very interesting debate on on uh, road space and and the use thereof. So any more comments or questions? I think we're right on time. Right. German hub. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll now say uh, in the next 50 minutes, we will um, share some reflections on the policy relevance um, from myself and uh, Philip. And I had prepared uh, just two slides about it. Um, so I'll go first and then Philip. Um, so policy challenges to mainstreaming transport energy poverty measurement. And I actually wanted to call this slide as five reasons why I don't think policymakers want to touch this, this issue. Uh, but I'm, I'm a bit on the, more on the pessimistic side always. So let's take this with a, with a pinch of salt. Uh, and I think we touched on some of these already. Uh, I, uh, the first one is I think there is less scope for win-win solutions. There are more win-win solutions that uh, tick both the social and the environmental box. When it comes to domestic energy poverty, things like insulation programs and so on. And in transport, it is more difficult because the transport mode that by far gives people the best access is the car, which is also typically the, the most expensive and also the worst for uh, the environment. So there is definitely a tension there uh, and um, there are now technological solutions, but they are also not that um, affordable and so on. And I think more in general, second point, transport is probably a more challenging sector for climate change mitigation. Because if you look at trends in transport emissions since 1990, transport, it's still typically, uh, even in Europe, uh, over uh, the values that it had in 1990. Uh, whereas uh, there's definitely been more progress in, 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 uh, in domestic energy. Um, so I think the question is slightly different in the two sectors in that perhaps in energy poverty, the question is, okay, we're making progress with decarbonization. How can we ensure that we do that in a way that it's not unfair? 
And in transport, it's more of a, well, actually, we would need much more radical action there. And, uh, and uh, can we do that in ways that are not, uh, you know, uh, unfair or triggering any kind of mass protest as we've seen. Uh, and also, I've, we touched on this topic a little bit. I think when it comes to transport related energy needs, it is much more difficult to define what these are in, in, in precisely when it comes to transport, because transport is uh, a means to an end or, or a, um, a means to a lot of different ends. I mean, you can travel to do pretty much everything, right? Uh, whereas uh, the sets of uh, perhaps the range of uses that that domestic energy can be put to are more slightly more uh, de definable. And so, for example, you have standards such as you know you you, you, uh, you should have 80 18 degrees in in your bedroom and 21 degrees in your living room, and you can model based on that. And but when you start defining where how much transport energy people will use, you need to make strong assumptions about why they need to go, how often, and then by which mode. And typically there will be different modes. So what, what is then a reasonable time threshold for them to use public transport as opposed to, to, to um, car travel and so on. So that is uh, very difficult. And there's also probably a, wa a much wider range of um, travel purposes that are important for people than we usually uh, consider. So there's a very nice example for that from that uh, Australian paper that looks at the link between transport energy poverty and, and uh, changes in, in, in motor fuel prices and um, subjective well-being. They find that the main causal pathways between those two is that when fuel prices go up, people would visit their friends and relatives less. But that's not typically something we consider, uh, at least within transport research, as 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 a sort of a service that you need to be able to access, right? We typically focus on tangible things such as can you get to the post office, can you get to the supermarket, right? Uh, but we don't consider that that social networks are, are very important there, but they're extremely variable within between households and also within households. So that makes it very very tricky. Uh, there's also risks, uh, I think, that the issue is exploited by vested interests, and I will give you an example of that. This is the RAC Foundation, which is the automobile club in the UK. Uh, a couple of years ago, almost 10 years ago, they published this piece of research, uh, which I think is incredibly misleading in that they concluded that 80% of the UK population is transport poor. Uh, if you see how they did it, they said, okay, they just took the, the fuel poverty indicator, which is the 10% one, you know, Brenda Borman's one, and they just used it as such in transport, including both, uh, you know, both uh, running costs and purchasing vehicles. And then they just applied it to quantiles and they found that uh, for each quantile, it's over 10%, except for the lowest one, because they have fewer cars, right? So the paradoxical result is it's everyone in the UK is either poor, or transport poor. Uh, and actually, if you look into it, the reason why the highest earning quintiles spend so much on transport is because of uh, a, lot of, a lot of their expenditure goes into things like purchasing very expensive cars very frequently. Uh, so it's not really appropriate to, to use it in that way, but still they did it, uh, no matter how implausible. And it, it did have some real impact in terms of, uh, I mean, they published this research a couple of days before the government was due to discuss budget and discuss whether to unfreeze the fuel duty. And of course, this was part of a massive campaign to, to keep uh, the, uh, the freeze on the fuel duty, which was successful and it keeps being successful until recently. Uh, so I definitely think there are some actors out there who uh, don't have questions of equity. Uh, it's not those questions are not very high among their priorities, but they try and use those questions to push their own agenda. And I think we need to be careful about that. Um, so just keep in mind that they find 80% is transport poor. And in my research with the UK data, I find it's 9%. So there's definitely a big, a big uh, difference between uh, what conclusion you reach depending on how you build the indicator. Um, 
that yeah the last point i think that there's there's a lack of data in in national and eu service which is something which is a problem on the domestic energy side as well but i think it's perhaps even more pronounced in uh, for transport because uh transport is very much seen as a as a, as a national um as a national um policy area and the community pushing for making this more international uh and and uh, for example, including indicators in EU silk is is much weaker as compared to um, uh, domestic energy. And I will now stop and um, leave it to um, Philip for his consideration. Yes, let me say something uh, more positive about the uh, possibilities uh, of subjective well-being in this approach um, to convince or nudge policymakers into into um, investing uh, in this area. Um, one is that this, uh, as I've presented the this uh, approach with using subjective well-being data to assess welfare effects of circumstances of um, decisions or of um, um, yeah, situations like like being transport poor, energy poor, or having a forced car ownership, and so on, is a is a very easy to enter um, aspect when you talk to policymakers. Because in in science, it's very hard because of uh, the the complexity of the models, because of the uh, whole uh, part with the regression analysis, and so on, um, to convince your colleagues that you are uh, you are really um, focused and really measuring certain effects there. Um, while if you talk to policymakers or ge the general public, they it is a in, in substance, this approach is um, quite easy to understand. You know what is going on there if, 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 if you say, uh, well, being poor or being energy poor makes people unhappy and having longer travel distances makes people unhappy. And this is easy to understand and you have an easy access um, to those arguments. At the same time, uh, you can provide policymakers with scientific evidence, and this, it is um, if the if if you design your models carefully and if you uh, have good data quality and so on, then you have a a uh, high quality research outcome that um, supports very easy to sell arguments, and this is a very very favorite tool of policymakers, um, being being able to transmit easy messages. Uh, with scientific foundations um, and, to, and to have kind of empirical results because uh, empirical results in, in policy making is, is, is very unvoke these days. Um, you, you deliver kind of empirical results for policymakers. On the other hand, you have to be very careful about what you, uh, what policymakers draw out of your studies. Uh, I remember the first time we were um, mentioned in the newspaper uh, in uh, with with results from well-being data was that we we did a very careful assessment where we compared the um, where we compared the effect of income on well-being with the effect of renewable energies on well-being and we said well uh, you could say with all the care you have uh, we said this in our summary uh, you could say that one kilowatt hour of green uh, energy is like um, 50 bucks of income a month or something like that. It's not exactly these numbers, but this was the only part which was cited in the newspaper, you can imagine, right? So of course you have to you have to be very careful when when um, providing your results, when advertising your results. But on the other hand, you have an easy to access argument for policymakers to say, well, this is important. If I can say, well, um, people suffer from energy poverty and we can prove this with our with our data it's not just that we say well uh, it's a usual um, usual argument or a natural nexus between uh, poverty and and, and uh, utility or poverty and welfare but there is there is a sizable amount and we can say it's it's of the same size as to lose your job or or to uh, to worsen your health or something like that and another very important argument where i would say uh, could support um, to use this uh, well-being approach for a welfare assessment and to convince policymakers with it is that you you calculate average effects and of course if you if you say there's a group in the population like the energy poor and you can prove that certain um, certain um, measures or policies will reduce the the uh, the suffering from energy poverty um, you can say well 
this is um, this is a proof uh, that the average of this population group will will um, will gain from those policies, and um, this is this is also an argument which which uh, might convince a lot of policymakers to to step into that problems and to see uh, or or to to put the problems higher on the agenda and then. And then you can come with uh, come around with uh, all the analysis which uh, goes into the uh, design of policy. What are the right instruments to reduce those issues? But um, the first step, uh, I would say, is to to um, provide policymakers with with a proof that this is welfare relevant. And this is re welfare relevant not only for um, in in terms of a theoretical. Um, thinking about the problem that uh, poverty is something bad uh, anyway, but you can say, well, being in energy poverty reduces the well-being of people. And this is a significant effect, which you can see on average in the pop population. And this is a, a, a very relevant problem. And people are, um, are in a relevant size suffering from that issues. Okay, so this is my my call for um, being keen on presenting uh, presenting those results to the public and also being keen on um, using this uh, this welfare assessment approach. There are other kinds of welfare assessment that work as well. Um, I've presented them in my or I've I've shown you in my presentation. Um, I think it holds true for most of those uh, of those uh, means of welfare assessment um, to to have a good tool to convince convince or to nudge policymakers into starting action. Thank you, Philip. Um, we have one minute left. So I think we have time for any last comment or question on this. So if there isn't any, we're all tired, I suppose. We can, we will press stop the recording and and then um okay thank you very much everyone thank you yeah it was great i enjoyed it